I'm walking on the battlefield of Naseby, Northamptonshire. This was the scene for the decisive battle of the English Civil Wars. The long wars that set brother against brother, father against son, and more importantly, led to the execution of King Charles I. Naseby was fought in June 1645, and it came after nearly three years of bitter warfare between the forces of the King and the armies of Parliament. History remembers them as cavaliers and roundheads. It's an oversimplification, of course, but it does neatly sum up those who are for and those who are against the King. In many ways, it was very modern warfare. New or improved weapons appeared on the battlefield. Mortars, muskets, we'll see them in action and we'll see how battlefield surgery and medicine tried to keep up. The year 1645 also saw the appearance of the country's first ever professional army. It was the brainchild of a man called Oliver Cromwell and it was called the New Model Army. It changed the face of the war and it got its first major action right here at Naseby. I'm Carl Uda Martinez. From an early age, I was thrown into the exciting world of jousting and historical combat stunt displays. I've always been fascinated with what it was like for the common soldier throughout history. What did they experience? What horrors did they witness? And how devastating were their weapons? On the battlefield, how important were these instruments of death? King Charles I raised his standard at Nottingham on August the 22nd, 1642. Every effort to avoid civil war had failed, and now the differences between Parliament and King were about to be resolved in the time-honoured way on the battlefield. When one looks at reasons for the civil war, there are no simple, straightforward reasons which apply across the board. Uh, in England, there was an argument about who was going to control the expenditure of government. Was it going to be Parliament? Was it going to be the King? There was an argument in Scotland about religion. What form of Protestantism was going to hold sway there? In Ireland, the worry was that the Catholic powers of Europe would use Ireland as a stepping stone to come into England coupled with the fact the king marries a Catholic wife. And so the Protestants of England are worried about Catholic takeover. The fact is you've got a mess, a real mess of arguments with a whole lot of special interests, which the king, King Charles, in his infinite wisdom, manages to unite into a single united opposition, a considerable achievement. King makes an attempt to take over Parliament or take out the troublesome MPs by force. That fails. And eventually he raises his standard at Nottingham. The first pitched battle came at Edge Hill in October 1642. The indiscipline of the Royalist cavalry probably cost Charles outright victory there. But even so, many historians agree that if the King had marched quickly on London afterwards, as he was urged to do, then the war could have ended very swiftly and very differently. But he didn't, and the scene was set for almost two more years of inconclusive fighting. Prior to Naseby, what has happened is, an, is a stalemate. The King falls back to Oxford, and so what you've got is the development of the attempt to create centres of um, influence, centres of power, which will enable you to surround and control the enemy and to defeat him in the field. Parliament have got London, they've got Cambridge, they've got Kings Lynn, Northampton, a little bit beyond, and then swaying around to so the whole of East Anglia. The king is controlling, by and large, most of the rest of the country at this point, and it, that is eroded over time and the balance is even between the two sides. How are you going to get out of this mess? So that's the problem at the beginning of the year. 
The war may have dragged on, but it gave both sides plenty of time to get to grips with the weapons of the era. In the evolution of warfare, the conflict in 17th century England was now seeing firepower starting to appear all over the battlefield. Gone was the rare and cumbersome handguns of the Middle Ages, and in their place the musket, firing armour piercing lead balls, was now commonplace. The musket was the forerunner of the guns that we see dominating the battlefield of today. But the matchlock, so called because it used a slow burning piece of cord to ignite the gunpowder, was probably less effective than the medieval longbow in combat. Unlike the longbow, which took a lifetime of practice to master, a musketeer could be trained in a matter of weeks, which made the weapon popular with two armies that were being hastily put together. Historical firearm expert Ian Hen told us more. So Ian, tell me about what you've got here. Well, basically what, what we've got here is a early matchlock musket. It was uh, sort of the first of what you think is a, looking like a, a bit like a modern firearm. It's a uh, muzzle loading, black powder, yeah. and it's, uh, it fires with the, uh, with the match. So, very temperamental then, I would have thought, to try and light the match. Very unreliable, especially yeah. in uh, poor weather conditions. Yeah. The match could go out, it could burn at different rates. Sometimes the powder would go in the pan, but not ignite the main charge. It could blow out the wind, it could go out the rain. So not great uh, if you're on a battlefield. No, no, you've got and, people rushing around. And often got... it would turn into a club. Yeah. Resort to yeah. yielding it or that. Uh, there was no actual standard. And isn't there a famous saying that comes from this? That's right, yeah, keep it under your hat. So the, the match, because it was unreliability, they, they would carry a lot of spare and they would coil it up and they would stick under the hat to try and keep it dry. And that's where, keep and that's it under where your keeping something under your hat comes from. Fantastic. They were quite a terror weapon. They were quite impressive. There was a big, a big flash, a big flame out the end, a lot of smoke. And in mass battles with volley fire, they could be effective against uh, infantry. So how are we going to demonstrate how effective this weapon is? Well, uh, we'll get ourselves ready. We'll uh, light the match and we'll uh, try against some targets. Brilliant. And see how you get on. OK, look forward to it. Can I have a go? You certainly can, yeah. See how your aim is. Whoa. Wow, what a so, range, what a, that's just absolutely, there was a bit of a kick on it as well, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, yeah. And also I wasn't expecting it to take so long on the, on the no. press of the trigger, I had to keep the trigger down and wait. That is one of the problems with the match lock, that uh, if the match is not hot enough, you have to keep blowing on it, the wind, it can, it can take the heat out of it. Uh, yeah. it, it hits a, a, a patch where there's not very much saltpeter in the hemp rope. It's unbelievable because really you don't know when it's going to go off. It's, no, it, you, they it's, are it's, notoriously I, I, unreliable. I don't, know if I, I don't know if I'd like to be on a battlefield with loads of people trying to kill me when waiting with my finger on the, on the trigger waiting for it to go off. No. Well, yeah. that, that, this is the uh, a weapon of the English Civil War and towards the end of the Civil War they had the early flint knocks which are known as dog locks and uh, we've got a dog lock for you to try. So okay. basically the same weapon but you'll see it's a Bit, a little bit more controlled. A slightly more reliable ignition system. Did I just shoot that bird in the top of the tree? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll have a go with the, okay. uh, the dog lock and see how you get on. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> the dog or wheel lock musket was the first self-igniting firearm in place of the unreliable match. A rotating steel wheel rubbed against a piece of pyrite, generating intense sparks which ignited gunpowder in the pan, which in turn ignited the main charge in the barrel similar in action to a modern cigarette lighter, and this ignition system was far more reliable than the earlier matchlock. And another shot. Did I get him? You did, yes. Oh, I singed my hair as well. Oh, do you know what? I like this one. I don't like the matchlock. I like this. I really like this gun. It's got a nice feel to it. It's um, not as um, much of a kickback as the match. No, it's either. not. It's, it's quite a heavy gun and it's quite a long gun. Yeah. They would have, a lot of the time they would have fired these from a, a long rest with a fork in the top. But being long and fairly heavy, it helps you to keep the muzzle down. Yeah. And uh, that's why you were, it looked like you were pretty yeah. much in the should, centre of the torso. Should we go so. and have a look and see let's, where I got this time? Let's have a look, see okay. what you've done again. So, yeah. You can see a couple more holes in. 
Yeah, you've. Uh, oh, look at that! You've clipped him again. Look at that! I got him. I got him. That was the match lock. Yeah, that's right. And this one here. Look at that! And look at the. Is that why is it not completely round? Is that just because of the way it's entered into <coughs> the? It's just the way it's splintered. I'm, I'm quite happy with that, you know. Yeah, that that's that is good shooting with this with this type of weapon. Any any shot in a torso with a, a ball of that size, if you've got a three quarter inch ball in your hip, yeah. That's going to put you out of action. Yeah. And yeah. you're not you're not going to be fighting that battle anymore. No. And you may well end up dying of your wounds. At the beginning of the 1645 fighting season, neither side had really made up their mind what it was they wanted to achieve. What the new model army thought they wanted to do was to take back the West Country. The king, however, had got a problem because he was worried about Chester. Chester was where supplies came in from Ireland. So he set off to relieve the siege of Chester. Parliament decides that far more important than the West Country is the opportunity to take Oxford while the King's away. So the King suddenly discovers, and his followers discover, that his central headquarters is besieged but they decide they've got to do something about it. First thing to do is to smack Leicester in the teeth. Parliament has heard that the King has had a crack at Leicester. So they call their dogs off Oxford and say to Fairfax, go after the King. So you've got these two forces who, uh, if, if you're not careful, are going to pass each other in the night <laughs> as the Royalists go down to Oxford and as the New Model Army head up towards Leicester. And then the two bump. On the morning of the 14th of June, 1645, the Parliamentarian Captain General, Sir Thomas Fairfax, and the commander of his cavalry, Oliver Cromwell, gazed through the early morning mist, searching for the Royalist army that they knew was nearby. On a distant ridge to the north lay the Royalist forces, so they gave the order to marshal their troops, ready to do battle. The 9,000 strong Royalist army commanded by the King and his nephew, Prince Rupert of the Rhine, was originally positioned on a ridge between the villages of Little Oxenden and East Farndon. The Royalist force was full of experienced veteran soldiers and confidence was high. At the start of the war, both sides had to cobble together their forces with few professional soldiers to call on. Now, after nearly three years of warfare, the two sides had become used to a life on campaign and living off the land and its local populations. Everything that they could lay hands on was used either for fuel or for food or for shelter. And the losses of food suffered by the local population were immense. It was not just food and drink that was sourced from the locals. I travelled to Torrington in Devon to see how even musket balls were made by soldiers in the field. Chris, it's very cosy in here. You've brought me into your house or, or your yeah. linny, as, yeah. as it's called. But a strange place to be manufacturing weapons. Well, there again, you see, uh, when you're on the march, uh, you have to use everything you can. Now, if you have the muskets, you've got to have musket balls. And usually young lads, so as young as 10 years of age, will be apprenticed into the army to the musketeer, and it's their job to make the musket balls. Okay. The boys will be given a mould and a ladle. You put the lead into the mould, into the ladle, into the fire, yeah. let it melt down. Now, if you're on the march, you have to get your lead from somewhere. So where are you going to find some lead? Roofs, church roofs. The church roof. <laughs> there again, being good, honest, royalist we, soldiers, yeah. we wouldn't dream of stealing from the church, would we? No, we just borrow their lead yeah. and we fire it back at them. <laughs> <laughs> right, the lead should be melted by now, so let's see if we make a musket ball. Yeah, definitely. You've got your mould and it's got a hole at the top, right? Mm -hmm. So we take our molten lead and we just pour it into the mold at the hole at the top right okay. once we've done that we get a little bit comes over the top we open the mold and there's your musket ball that. that is hot all right take it out you 
There you are. Now what you have to do... You just cut it off, do you? Yes. Like that, it wouldn't go in the barrel no. the, the, of the musket. So you have to cut this piece off, which we call the sprue. That comes off. That goes back into the pot, so Nothing nothing's wasted. wasted, right. And okay. you have your musket ball. It seems pretty dangerous for 10-year-olds to be making these, though. Well, that's it. But with that, that is pewter. Now, normally, we would have used lead. Right, okay. Lead is poisonous. Yeah. And it gives off poisonous fumes. So you've got to add that into it as well, right? Now, you could always tell a musketeer when he was out without his musket, because mm. he always had green teeth and green lips. Right. Well, now, when you're on the battlefield, you wouldn't fumble into the bag to get your balls out, right? You used to put them in your mouth, just spit them out, put them in the barrel. No. So a musketeer always had green teeth and green lips. Because of the lead. Back at Naseby, in the early morning mist, the Royalists were still unaware of the Parliamentarian army that was ahead of them. The King's initial position was very strong, but he was keen to find Fairfax's army and engage them. After seeing a contingent of Parliamentary cavalry while scouting ahead, Rupert brought the King's army forward and headed for Naseby Ridge, the very same position that Fairfax troops were occupying. By the time the Royalists reached the village of Clipston, they could see about a mile ahead of them Naseby Ridge, occupied by the Parliamentarians. Any kind of withdrawal would have become a bloody retreat, with the potential for Cromwell's highly trained cavalry, known as the Ironsides, to harry their exit. So Rupert set his standard on Dust Hill, with the shallow valley of Broadmoor separating the two sides. The Battle of Naseby was now only hours away. The parliamentarians formed up here on Naseby Ridge. In fact, they withdrew a little from their original position as Cromwell was concerned that the royalists might think their force too strong to actually attack. What stood here awaiting the royalists was not the ad hoc force that the parliamentarians had put into battle before. No, this was the new model army, a trained, cohesive fighting force. And that was the theory, the upcoming battle would be its first test in action. The new model army was founded in January 1645, and it was an army of professional soldiers, not part-time militia, with officers who had earned their rank rather than have had it handed to them because of their social standing. The soldiers in it were bound together by strong, mainly Puritan religious beliefs. At Naseby, the parliamentarians would outnumber the 9,000 strong royalists with a force of roughly 14,000 men from this new model army. So by 10 a.m. both sides had taken their positions. Fairfax had ordered his infantrymen to form up below the ridge behind me to hide his numbers from the eyes of the royalists who were lined up on the ridge opposite. At this point, Cromwell spotted an opportunity to use the Solby hedges on the left of the battlefield to the parliamentarian's advantage. Wanting the Royalists to make the initial assault, Cromwell sent a force of some 600 dragoons commanded by Colonel John Oakey to ride up behind the hedge and pour musket fire into Prince Rupert's cavalry, which was stationed on the King's right flank, forcing them into an attack. At Solby Hedges, we met local Naseby expert Peter Burton to find out what happened next. Peter. Ah, good morning. Thanks for talking to us. My pleasure. Uh, this is a great viewpoint from up here, isn't it? It is indeed. That's why we put the platform in. Yeah. Well, t why do you think the battle started here then? Well, when Oakey got into this field, very shortly afterwards, he would have seen Prince Rupert and his cavalry and infantry approaching from the north. Rupert sent his infantry forward to this hedge line in front of us here and drove the dragoons out, uh, flushed them out of this hedge with musket fire. Oakey's dragoons fell back below this ridge line just here and into these hedges you see before you for cover. Uh, unfortunately for Rupert and his troops, um, 
those dragoons were in the perfect position to pour enfilade fire, flanking fire, into Rupert's cavalry as they began to move um, south across Broadmoor to charge Henry Ireton's parliamentary troops on the opposing ridge. So quite a strategic move then. Oh, it was indeed. It confined the Royalists um, to the battlefield that Cromwell and Fairfax wanted to fight on. The horses can't stand still with this stuff coming in on them. And so the Royalist cavalry charge begins there. Now the cavalry used to pack together tightly, form themselves into a solid line. It was like a great big animated tank that could break through. And you didn't gallop, you didn't canter, because the horse becomes uncontrollable. You're a good, solid trot. And you go in with the sword and you're leaning forward over the neck of your horse with your sword arm in front of you and trying to get your sword under the guard of the other guy's helmet so that you take him in the neck. The blood loss is terrific. It doesn't tend to obscure the view because it's like fighting in a red shower of ghastly smelly rain. But otherwise, they are slashing at each other with these swords or just skirmishing because the, the effect of this charge is to break up the formation and it, everybody gets in a mess and you've got a series of individuals turning their horses trying to get the advantage come from behind the side and so forth. The effect is immense because the centre two regiments of Ireton's cavalry are punched out, pushed clean out of the line, a hole is punched in the middle of the line, Ireton's own regiment fall back alongside the infantry, Butler's regiment falls back alongside Salby Hedges, and the two regiments in the middle recoil. And a lot of Royalist troops pour through. They may have secured an initial victory, but as they pursued their enemies, the Royalist cavalry fell upon the parliamentarian baggage train, and their lust for plunder kept them from the field of battle as they fought for loot. To protect themselves in battle, a cavalry man would wear the iconic three-bar pot helmet, which would usually include an articulated neck guard and a chest and back plate worn over a thick leather buff coat, which was supposed to protect from slashing blows. It was not uncommon for the buff coat to be worn on its own without the plate pieces, but how effective could a piece of leather be against a cavalry sword? we put it to the test. That civil war it really did bring on disciplined cavalry warfare. I mean, what I've got here is a heavy cavalry sword, much later than the civil war. If you lift up the trotter of the pig, yeah? Keep your head out of the way. Yeah. I'll aim just for there. You sure? Yeah, yeah, don't worry. Good aim. Yeah, I think I am, yeah. Oh. Yeah, now look at that. Yeah, that's, gone, that's actually gone right down yeah, into the bone. it's gone about that much. Yeah. You can actually see the bone. Yeah, so it's cut into the bone. Oh, look at that. So how would they defend themselves from this? I mean, what would they wear? Well, I mean, you know, obviously the plate armour, but obviously they needed to be quite mobile as well, didn't they? Well, this is it. The cavalry work was getting faster and faster, more manoeuvrable like, around the battlefield. So they needed the supple armour. So they developed the buff coat. Okay. It's, it's, it's a soft leather coat. Oh, this is what this is? Yeah, about. it's five mil yeah. leather. Um, but it had a padded quilt underneath, very similar to this jerkin. Right. Yeah, so you, as a cavalryman, you'll be very, very hot on the battlefield, but you'll be able to manoeuvre. They have scarves around their neck, quite thick scarves as well, to stop the slash into the neck. Why don't you have a go, see if you can slash somewhere around here okay. into the sword. Yeah, yeah, right, there you go. It. Okay. Ah! 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 Oh. Look at that. That's actually, st I mean, you can see the line, but yeah. it hasn't cut through, has it? No, it's just. The, and this is just sharp. Scored it. Just scored it, that's all. See, two score marks, that's it. So that would have been a, a thud to the, to the body, to the bone, but it wouldn't have cut. No. That's impressive, isn't it? But that would have broken his bone, surely. I, I would have broken his shoulder. Not necessarily. He got thick padding underneath, and with the over layer, you can have up to 10 mil, maybe even 15 mil of leather on there, layer after layer. Like a modern. Flak jacket, yeah. layer upon layer. So it did work then? Very much so. I mean, these were in existence and in use for well over 100 years. 
With half of the parliamentarian cavalry swept from the battlefield, the Royalist infantry now advanced with their great pikes in a line of men over half a mile wide, itching to get to grips with their round head foe. The use of long spears in formation had been used in warfare ever since Greek times, but by the 17th century, massed ranks of pike were used by most European armies as a way of protecting infantry and especially musketeers from mounted cavalry attacks. The pike was not just for defense, and a common occurrence in the battles of the English Civil Wars was for two sides of opposing pikemen to fight each other. Back in Torrington, I discovered how hard it was to use this simple yet unwieldy weapon. To begin with, I put on the corselet, the armoured protection for the pikeman, consisting of a helmet and breast and back plates, which connected thigh guards called tassets. Wow, there you go. It's very tall, I wasn't expecting it to be this long. 16 to 18 feet. It's made of ash and the top end is a sharp razor sharp spike. It's a bit wobbly, isn't um, it? Yeah. Now, the thing about it, the soldiers give them names. Really? Suitable for the weapon that it is. Uh, this one's called Revenge. Okay, Revenge. So you've now got Revenge. Okay. You've just got a single pike and it's not really much use as a weapon, okay. just one of you. So you're going to have 50 to 100 people in what's called a pike block. Okay. All right, then it becomes quite a useful weapon. Right. So we'll march off now and then we'll get into a position and we'll show you how to use it as a weapon. Okay. For the attack, it comes in three moves. The first move is port your pike. The next thing you're going to do in the next command is called charge your pike. So the next command will be to march on. March on. Bloodthirsty scream. How was that bloodthirsty scream? Was that good? That was pretty good. It terrified most people. So, what is actually happening as this pike formation are coming against this pike formation? They're not running, like you say, which I find really hard to understand that they're just going into each other. What's actually going on? It's, it's actually quite difficult to, to, to run, run when you're this, holding yeah. one of these. Yeah. So, you, it's a steady moment, motion. Mm. So, you run, and it's what's called clash of pikes. So, you get the two lots of pikes and they, they come at the end, and then you get push of pike where they're pushing against each other. And if you get hit by one of these, you'll certainly know about it, which is why the ones at the front, if you've got armor on, you'll be a bit better off. The other thing is that, of course, when you get in really close, this, this becomes obsolete, really, because yeah. once somebody's inside it, you're not going to be able to use it as, as a it's weapon. A weapon. Yeah. It's a big, ungainly stick. So then you let go? So you let go of that, draw your sword. Yeah, that's the only weapon left to me, isn't it? It is. Um, and you've got your helmet, and you've got your knee, you've got all sorts of it, it's just like a brawl, really. So I'm slashing, thrusting, just trying to... A free-for-all, basically. A free-for-all. Yeah. And, and this isn't necessarily sharp, but it, it is a, quite a, a lump of, of steel. Yeah. And if you smack somebody around the leg with that, you'll probably break their leg, even if you don't cut them. And I would use it in, in whatever way, thrusting, slashing, it's, stabbing. It's, it's, it's mostly it's a cutting weapon, yeah. but you've got the, the hilt you can use. You can smack somebody in the face with it, bring up your knees yeah. and whatever else you want to. Brutal, absolutely brutal. It's a brutal free-for-all where anything goes. That's the one. Not for the faint-hearted. Back here at Naseby, the Royalists kept up their advance, passing the monument behind me. When the two sides came together here, there was only time for one volley of musket fire before they found themselves fighting hand-to-hand, -hand, stabbing with daggers, clubbing with the butts of their rifles. By this point, the pikemen probably drop their pikes because they're too close to, to manoeuvre with them. So they draw swords and they get going with the sword. So they're slashing and prodding and poking. And people are starting to get wounded and the ground is starting to get covered in blood. And they come absolutely physically together face to face. And they're reduced to punching each other, to kicking each other, possibly to biting each other. And you get this great brawl going for as long as they can sustain it, possibly five, six, seven minutes. And then the front line of both sides are tired and they step back and take a deep breath and gather themselves together and possibly kick a corpse out of the way and then get cracking at it again. And this goes on and on and on. And you are tired and you are thirsty. 
and you are ruddy terrified. After half an hour of fierce fighting, the Parliamentarian Centre started to give ground and fall back. Here on the right, the remainder of the Parliamentarian cavalry, led by Cromwell, looked on helplessly. In front of them, across the valley, lurked the rest of the Royalist horse. If Cromwell was going to come to the aid of his beleaguered infantrymen, then the Royalist cavalry needed dispatching as quickly as possible. Luckily for Cromwell, the Royalist cavalry, commanded by Sir Marmaduke Langdale, blinked first. Even though outnumbered two to one and having to charge uphill over difficult terrain, Langdale's horse attacked Cromwell. Unsurprisingly, the Royalists were routed by Cromwell's Ironsides. Only half of the Ironsides had been committed to dealing with Langdale and now, with Prince Rupert's cavalry units engaged in pursuit and plunder, Cromwell's reserve could wheel left and turn its attention to the fierce infantry battle. It was now the turn of the Royalists to be put under pressure, with Cromwell's cavalry attacking from the right, the Parliamentarians' reserves strengthening the line from behind, and even Oakey's dragoons entering the battlefield from Solby Hedges. There could only be one result. After two hours of hard fighting, the Royalists started to retreat. With the situation looking hopeless, many Royalist soldiers began to throw down their weapons, while others at least tried to make a fighting retreat. By the time Prince Rupert's cavalry returned to the battlefield, it was too late. Naseby was lost. The king got away with his immediate followers. Anybody who was mounted had a very good chance of getting away. Anybody who was mounted and not wounded and his horse wasn't hurt had a good chance. But the fleeing infantry had got a lot bigger problem. The aftermath of the battle showed the depth of the hatred between the two sides. Many royalists were hunted down and slaughtered in a village churchyard. More than a hundred women camp followers were also killed in cold blood by parliamentarian troops. As the fighting petered out, the dead and wounded and those taken prisoner could be counted. For the King's army, annihilation. Up to 1,000 Royalists had been killed, with four to 5,000 taken prisoner. Those figures meant that he had lost three quarters of his army at Naseby. The Parliamentarians had lost around 150 men, with 500 wounded. And what are the wounded? What fate awaited them? As in medieval times, a barber surgeon may have treated their battlefield wounds with the removal of musket balls at the top of their list. I visited 17th century medical expert Tom Henderson to see how the wounded would fare in the barber surgeon's hands. So what kind of horrific injuries would we have been seeing on the battlefield that the barber surgeon had to sort out? Quite a few different kinds. You're going to have musket ball wounds, um, you're going to have sword wounds, um, pike wounds, pike wounds. Ooh, um, nice nice. Quite, quite rough, yeah. yeah. Um, mainly like wounds of the flesh like that, which you're either going to take amputation or just digging out of of musket balls and, and various other implements that end up within the body parts. Well, these musket balls must have caused absolute carnage in their time. So what kind of injuries were these oh, causing? This is a horrific part of the weapon. Uh, this is one of one third ounces. It's about 33 grams in your day of pure lead back then. Um, very, very soft because they had no way to harden lead. Right. Uh, so as it went in, if it hit a bone, it shattered the bone, but it would spread on impact as well. Um, the surgeon uh, at that point uh, has no choice other than to just try and scrape out as much as possible. <laughs> he's then going to seal the wound, you'll cauterise it, uh, and then he's going to send you on your way hoping for the best. Literally just patch you up and Pretty send you much, on, yeah. and then you'd um, probably die a couple you'll of You'll die of lead poisoning yeah. somewhere along the line because they didn't understand lead poisoning at the time. And then also, not only is it shattered into lots of tiny little pieces, but you've also got all the bacteria, all the soil, yeah, all the wood, yeah, um, all the, all the stuff you're wearing. Exactly, you've got all, the, all of the, uh, the fibre going in. At, at that point, all the surgeon can do is just going to try and once again, scrape out as much as possible um, and then cauterise the wound. Um, 
they'd either pour the boiling oil into it or yep. they'd use the cautery irons and they were made in the shape of the wounds they were dealing with. This one was for musket balls. Okay, so they actually made it in the shape. They would heat it in the fire till it was red hot and then into the wound and burn the wound closed. Wow. Uh, they also had them for stab wounds, for sword wounds, yep. uh, that they could actually put into the wound to cauterise it. So all this is going on without painkillers and anaesthetic, I take it? Well, they did exist. Um, they, had thing, they had laudanum, they had opiates. Um, most surgeons um, either wouldn't or couldn't use them. Uh, if the patient's kicking and screaming, yeah. letting out good lusty bellows, yeah. well, you know he's still alive, it's worth continuing the operation. No. So many surgeons wouldn't use them for that reason. So you basically, I take it people really didn't want to go to see the barber surgeon? If you're in the army, it's a bit like the army today, in theory you have to go to the surgeon. It wasn't uncommon for people just to crawl off a battlefield thinking there's no way I'm going in that tent sort of thing. But they do say in the 17th century that um, the, the, the people would wait for as long as possible that uh, was the last possible moment before visiting a barber surgeon, and they actually think that more of them survived that way. Naseby may have seen the destruction of the King's infantry, but the war still continued. Instead of large set-piece battles, the conflict became a process of mopping up individual royalist towns by the parliamentarians. To achieve this, artillery was needed to pound the defenders into submission. There were people who would fight for the king until their last drop of blood. And they were still out there. Now, certain of them would give up because a, a, a parliamentary force would arrive and surround the place. And that the deal was that if you besieged a place, uh, you surrounded it so nobody could go in or out. And then you send a messenger in and say, well, look, we've got you surrounded now. What are you going to do? You can't eat, you can't drink, I mean, you're going to run out. You've had it. Now you've got this going on all over the country in little patches. By the mid-17th century, artillery had become an integral part of an army's armoury. When used in sieges against a static target, artillery could be devastating. The mortar which fired an explosive bomb high over walls being the most destructive. Roaring Meg was the largest mortar of the English Civil War. She was instrumental in the capture of Goodrich Castle by the parliamentarians in 1646. Ian Hen, who has created an exact replica of this famous piece of 17th century artillery, showed me why she was such a powerful part of the parliamentarian arsenal in this phase of the war. It's a beast, isn't it? It is. It is, it is a big weapon, yeah. It's a short cannon firing at 45 degrees. But this was sort of one of the biggest uh, that, that was built of the, of the period. It fired a 200-weight um, a projectile filled with uh, gunpowder, and it did its damage not by the impact, but actually when it blew up after it landed. We're, we're actually going to fire uh, something out of it, aren't we? Gonna, what, what are we going to fire? We're going to fire one of these projectiles downrange okay. and uh, give you some sort of indication as what it actually did. Uh, in real life. And how far roughly are we expecting this to go? It'll go about 100 yards. And do I need to do this? Uh, you need to do this or you need to put your hands in front of your ear yeah, okay. and uh, to protect your ears because it will be a bit of a bang. This it's one. very exciting. The gun is now uh, loaded, primed and ready to fire. So literally, we are now literally ready to go. It's ready to go. We'll touch it off now and uh, see what happens. Bring it on, Ian. Bring it on. Let's fire it. <laughs> that was amazing. Should we go and see where it went? Yeah, let's go and see if we can find it. Do you think we'll find it? I think we'll find it this time. I can't believe how far that went up. If I in, that's uh, that was amazing. Well, that's uh, that's where it landed. No. I mean, Look how it's gone into the ground. <coughs> you can see the angle it's landed. And then it's bounced out. It's bounced out. There it is. <laughs> and there, there it's, there it's bounced too. Look at 
I mean, you. Uh, I mean, that was quite a way, but I mean, you can go further than that. Yeah, you, that, we reduced the charge on that, but you could probably, you could at least double the range <sighs> on a full charge. It's amazing to know what they were even back then in that time. They were they were doing this. I mean, they're pretty ahead of their time, really, if you think about it. Yeah, it was pretty pretty horrendous if you got that coming at you, yeah. and that may well have had, you know, anything up to six pounds of gunpowder inside it. So it was going to be quite a big bang after it landed. <laughs> After firing the dummy mortar round, Ian and his crew set up a simulated charge so he could see what damage a bomb inflicted once it went off. That did some serious damage, that did it, didn't it? <coughs> it's taken these two men right out. <laughs> I think I got, got a little <laughs> bit on my head. <laughs> oh, look at the size of the hole. That is impressive, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, it's quite deep, isn't it? Look at all the debris around it. You wouldn't want to be anywhere near that when it went off. Well, would not you? at all. I mean, this guy completely, absolutely mullered. Well, he wouldn't, probably wouldn't be parts left of him, really, would there? No, it would have taken him apart. Yeah, there would be literally bits <coughs> of him. And this one is uh, not very much better. I mean, it's a, it is massive destruction, isn't it? I mean, as soon as it lands, it's not the firing through. It's when it goes off, you can see why armies that used it, it would have turned their siege, the siege into their favour, wouldn't it? It would have done, and you can imagine it landing in a castle. Uh, there would be bits of sharp stone flying everywhere. And when it blew up, it could quite easily take a tower down. Yeah breached the wall and uh, traditionally once the wall was breached the uh, the siege was over. Yeah, not a chance. No, no, horrendous. Very few weapons sum up their era like those that were used at Naseby. When we see pictures of soldiers with pikes or matchlock muskets, we instantly think of the English Civil War they've become emblems of a dark period in British history. As was shown at Naseby, in the right hands, they were deadly. The men that used them all believed that right and God were on their side. Where before men had fought for personal power and plunder, they were now prepared to lay down their lives for a cause and the Battle of Naseby was a turning point for them all. Effectively, the infantry was completely destroyed either captured or killed. Not all that many killed, fewer than a thousand, we think. But there was no foot troops, no foot army remaining to Charles in the field. He only had cavalry. In other words, he was finished. There was absolutely no way that the king would ever recover in a military sense from what happened at Naseby. It was more than four and a half years before King Charles died upon the block, and those years saw more fighting and bloodshed. But the beginning of the end for him and his cause came on a warm summer's day, right here in 1645 in Naseby. <laughs> 